Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual public policy lecture on behalf of the MPhil in Public Policy Program and the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. Those of you who don't know me, um, that's shameful. Uh, <laughs> I'm Dennis Groob, I'm the director of the MPP and uh, I'm affiliated with the uh, Bennett Institute and it's my great pleasure to give this introduction today. A word or two about our sponsors. Uh, as many of you know, the Bennett Institute was launched, uh, formally launched in early 2018 to tackle public policy in the age of disruption, to somehow sort of get under the skin of public policy and try and work out why we run into the problems that we do. Uh, and under the leadership of, if I could embarrass them by pointing them out, Professor Michael Kenny uh, as uh, the leader of the Institute and our inaugural Bennett Chair of Public Policy, Professor Diane Coyle, um, they are very much the, uh, the Bonnie and Clyde of public policy, <laughs> uh, if I can put it that way, and I'm, I'm sure I'll pay for that later. Um, they uh, have very quickly established a strong voice for the Bennett Institute and made it um, uh, an important part of how Cambridge speaks to public policy in the UK. The MPP program is now in its seventh year. Uh, we are a one-year executive style masters and our goal is to attract passionate policy makers and with them examine public policy through a really diverse range of lenses. So let's look at public policy through philosophy, through economics, through politics, uh, and try and work out a rounded picture of how public policy works and why it doesn't. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I want to say a few words about two recent events. The first is the terrible tragedy that occurred in London last Friday. The deaths of Saskia Jones and Jack Merritt have reverberated through this university. We meet tonight, uh, I think, very much in the shadow of their passing, but with great respect and gratitude for the extraordinary work in which they were involved. Uh, the Learning Together program, its founders and its, its champions are great colleagues and friends to us uh, in the Bennett Institute and the MPP program. And I think whatever else this university stands for, it stands for the proposition that we, we grow through learning. We flourish through conversation and collaboration. And I think that's the spirit in which we meet tonight um, for this annual public policy lecture. Secondly, I want to comment on a different passing. Uh, as many of you know, just a few months ago, before the start of term, our dear friend and colleague, Dr Finbar Livesey, passed away after a fearsome two-year battle with cancer. As I mentioned, the MPP is now in its seventh year. And from the very start, of those seven years, Finbar was very much the beating heart of this degree, of this MPP. He served as deputy director, program director, and the shape and feel of the program owes so much to the passion that he had for public policy and for the students who come here to study it with us each year. Now, we particularly miss Finbar this evening because he would have been deeply engaged, both with our speaker and with her topic. Uh, Finbar was deeply frustrated with the contemporary state of our politics, with its apparent irrationality, and with its appeals to populism and denigration of expertise. So he would have been delighted that tonight we welcome someone who is not only an expert, but uh, an expert who is herself deeply engaged in the pursuit of understanding the interplay between politics and public policy. Polly McKenzie is someone who has seen government from the inside and out uh, and previously served as Director of Policy to then Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg from 2010 to 2015. After leaving government, policy, uh, Polly established the operations of the Women's Equality Party and then went on to found the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute 
uh, a charity working to break the link between financial difficulty and mental health problems. Today, she is, of course, the chief executive of DEMOS, that is uh, a cross-party think tank dedicated to exploring ideas on how democracy works, I guess, and how it can work better. Those of you who follow the news will know uh, how sought after Polly is for her views and her perspectives on these unique times. So we're very lucky um, that she's coming here this evening to speak to us about them under the promising title, Post-Populism Towards a New Democratic Settlement. Please join me in welcoming Polly to the podium. Polly. Uh, thank you. I, I can assure you that I have been called policy by accident before <laughs> on numerous occasions. It's an upgrade from people making jokes about kettles, so, which was my childhood. Uh, I feel like, you know, normative determinism has, has some value. Um, so I, I wanted also to actually start by, by paying tribute to, to the two Cambridge graduates who were murdered last Friday um, because it, it seems to me that Everybody who gets involved in, in public policy, in public service, is trying to make the world a better place. And, and those who dive into the kind of toxic world of trying to fix criminal justice policy are a particularly brave uh, kind of person. And uh, doing it at all is, is something that we should give thanks for, let alone making such, um, such a tragic sacrifice. Uh, at the end of their short lives. I didn't meet them. I know that there are people in this room who did, who knew them well, and I think we should all be grateful for not just them, but people, all people who give their lives in public service. Um, criminal justice policy is, is one of those subjects that has all of the ingredients of, of populist politics and ineffective policy making. It's the other reason why I kind of wanted to start there, actually, is um, we knew that before this attack, but the response to it has confirmed that all of the ingredients that make policy ineffective in solving problems exist in this kind of fevered topic of, of criminal justice policy. Uh, crime and terrorism are, are what we call wicked problems with multiple causes and networks of interconnected influences. People, people respond viscerally, simplistically, because prime, crime plays into some of the deepest narratives of our emotional lives right and wrong, justice and revenge. And then expert policymakers, people like me, tend to wade in with hyper-rational and counterintuitive solutions, which means that politicians end up virtue signaling their empathy in order to look like a normal guy by dismissing facts and evidence, hyperbolically blaming each other and reinforcing the myth that there are simple answers to the most complex questions. And meanwhile, crime rises and falls with little reference to the squabbles of politics and policy affected most profoundly by the huge social trends that shape our society. These four themes, uh, wicked problems, emotional responses, hyper-rational experts, and charlatan politicians are my themes tonight. I'm going to talk about all four of them uh, and how they are driving a populist politics which is profoundly in ineffective at resolving our problems. And then I'm going to set out some proposals for how we might change the way we run our country uh, to find something that might be called post-populism. I hope it exists, um, and that has a chance of moving us on. Um, and I'm not going to do a dance routine, you'll be pleased to know, despite this very tempting flaw. Um, uh, so you've heard a bit of my biography. I have spent basically 20 years working in politics and public policy. <laughs> but in a way, I think in the space between politics and public policy. So I have helped to design and cost policy and write white papers and draft legislation. But primarily my role has been translating politics into policy and then back again, and trying to find the words to explain, to justify, and to persuade. Uh, there are two things, basically, that I'm really good at. One is uh, coming up with clever policy ideas, uh, and the other is writing clever words to describe a policy so that it sounds better than it is, but is still technically true, the sort of thing that one might write on the side of a bus. Um, and... And I guess this lecture is really the story of my apostasy from both of those skills, from both partisan politics and technocratic policymaking. Um, 
there is, um, there is this great poem of religious apostasy, uh, which I, I, is one of my favorite poems. It's called Easter Day in Naples um, by a guy called Arthur Clough, who uh, you should read all of his work. It's great. Um, anyway, so he, uh, he was in Naples, and he suddenly had this moment of realizing that the resurrection story was a fiction. And he wrote this poem, and he says, um, it's very long. I, I love this line. He says, my heart was hot within me until at last my brain was lightened when my tongue had said, Christ is not risen. So basically, I'm hoping to use this lecture as a sort of form of therapy to, uh, to lighten my brain by admitting to myself and to you that a country where clever people like me sit in Whitehall, come up with clever ideas and clever ways of selling them will not thrive. If we want to get through populism to post-populism, we have to take both the slogan writers and the technocrats out of the driving seat and put the people in charge. But of course, putting the people in charge is also what the populists say. Uh, populists invoke the will or the welfare of the people to challenge established norms and institutions, usually to pursue a self-interested agenda. And it's, of course, an absurdity for a billionaire like Donald Trump to be talking about taking on the elites while living literally in a gold-lined tower, um, but such is the mystery of populism. If you can successfully tap into the outrage that people feel about systems that don't work in their interest, you can persuade them that you are on their side simply by attacking the system, even if nothing you offer would make a blind bit of difference. And of course, for millions of people, the system isn't working, so the market for this is vast. When you've been neglected and taken for granted by mainstream politicians, why not take a punt on something promising more? Populism, of course, gathers its strength from amplifying hatred of its enemies, whether they are the rich, the Jews, the bureaucrats, a computer that says no, or even an expert in a university telling you something you don't want to believe. And so populism drives division and hatred, and it puts lives in danger. And those risks are real. But it's important to recognize another reason why populism is so harmful to our democratic institutions is that it's just profoundly ineffective as a way of resolving our problems and making decisions. When the test for a political leader is not will it work, but does it sound good, will it make the blood run faster, that draws those leaders into cycles of impossible promises. There is still no wall, thank God, between the US and Mexico. And Brexit was not the easiest negotiation in history. And that slowly feeds into a, a growing quantity of distrust and distaste with politics. When confronted with their failure, of course, populists either walk away from responsibility, doubling down on their narrative about a conspiracy against the people, or they double down into authoritarianism, sharpening their attacks on their enemies to distract from and explain away their failure. And either way, democracy is damaged and progress stalls. But our country, all countries, cannot afford to see progress stalled. Our problems are vast. The response we need to climate change to prevent catastrophic harm to our planet and its ability to sustain human, human life. The demographic change that we are seeing across the West, not just an aging population putting demand on public services, but increasing diversity, immigration that will grow, has grown 100 million more people living outside of the country of their birth than at the beginning of the century. And that will continue to grow. It's not necessarily a problem. It's just a new way of us living together that requires new attempts to think it through. And trans technology is transforming our society as well. Uh, we have these vast global companies. They've grown faster than any of their predecessors. And they're stretching our understanding of the relationship between state and corporation, the way we think about competition policy. Uh, AI and machine learning are creating new challenges for regulators. And access to information has, of course, been radically democratized by the internet. But it's brought with it fake news, radicalization, outrage, and a new platform for interstate information warfare. Meanwhile, global power continues to shift east eastward. We're in the beginning of what could become a global trade war, and the basics of our international rules-based order come under threat from a growing number of leaders who prefer an oppositional approach to foreign policy where might determines right. And I think it is now an open question as to whether a democracy can deal with this level of change. Churchill, of course, said that democracy is the worst system of government except for all the others. But that doesn't mean we can't invent a new system. Uh, David Runciman, who uh, most of you will know, reminds us in his book that democracies do, in fact, die. And there's no reason to assume that ours is the exception to the rule. Um, 
There was a time when I was young, uh, in the mid to late 90s, when we thought of liberal democracy, I say we, I don't mean we, I mean, you know, the kind of collective we, as the end of history, as, uh, as Francis Fukuyama put it. Uh, the think tank I now run, Demos, published a book called Life After Politics, as if um, Blair's third way, finding this reconciliation between the battles of left and right, had literally brought politics to an end. Uh, and of course, with hindsight, we can see that these concepts are ostentatiously arrogant. Liberal democracy is not the necessary conclusion of a natural progression of history. We can't assume that anymore. It might not even be the best or the most efficient way to get things done. Of course, uh, I expect most people in this room believe that you can make a compelling first principles argument for democracy as the only just system of government and collective decision making. But Let's be realistic. Western democracies haven't just thrived because our system of organization is more just or more moral. They have thrived because it was also more effective. If our democracy can't pass this utilitarian test, then the chances are it will fail. And as our politics descends into populism and outrage, it's a, a real question as to whether it's actually adequate to the task of confronting our collective problems. The good thing is that democracy isn't one thing. There are an infinite number of ways in which to organize a democratic society, and ours must change and adapt if it's to be able to survive that utilitarian test. I think the way to do that is to put the people in charge. So um, I identified these four drivers of bad policymaking. Problems, wicked problems, emotional people, hyper-rational experts, and charlatan politicians. Now, the problems are an input, the fixed point in our dilemma. What about the people? Uh, it seems to me that there is a rising current of anti-democratic thought from many of the enemies of populism. Uh, let me read you a couple of comments made on social media by two friends of mine. Of course, I recognize that I live in a bubble, just like everybody else does. But these aren't people who are in politics. Um, so one of my friends uh, said, democracy is pointless if a vote from an educated person is equal to that of someone who's not. Uh, and last week, after watching a focus group of white working class voters in Birmingham, um, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, in 1917, they were cannon fodder. In 2016, and every year since, just fodder. Stupid, stupid, gullible fools. In Westminster, you're likely to hear from technocrats, think tankers, business leaders, especially business leaders, who all want to take their policy problem out of politics. So it might be infrastructure or climate change or interest rates or the NHS, Basically, people think it's not just politics that's getting away, but the fundamental problem is that the people are weak-minded, visceral, trapped in their own cognitive biases, incapable of making good decisions on their own behalf, let alone in the interests of other people, future generations, or people who look or behave differently. So they come up with ways to get around people, whether it's through the paternalist nudges of behavioral economics to trick people into doing what's right, or the manipulations of political campaigning, the people are basically a problem to be navigated, and the hurdles of democracy a barrier to resolving our nation's challenges. The funny thing is that technocrats and centrists have this big thing in common with the populists. They take rather a dim view of humanity. So you end up with wise, sensible thinkers like Charles Clark, a former Home Secretary, compiling a list of policy problems that belong in what he called the too difficult box. He believes that it's just impossible to persuade people of policy change that would be good for them. The thing this reminds me of is um, that bit in Roald Dahl's book, Matilda, where Miss Trunchbull explains how much better the school would be without the children. Um, it would be really nice to do this democracy thing without the people. And I'm afraid if you think people are the problem, then you're not a Democrat. People are a fixed input as well. Now, you can, of course, argue that the world would be better run by machines. And some people do. Um, there's these people called transhumanists who are actively planning for the time when we break the boundaries of our evolutionary inheritance and physical being, uh, and the 20,000 year long era of human dominance of our planet comes to an end. Well, I, I, I feel, I'm in an academic institute, so I feel obliged to sort of like consider all the boundaries of my problem and come up with a first principles justification for why I'm not interested in that. But the answer is that I don't have one. I'm just, I'm a human and I'm on our side. And I think that that's okay. Uh, maybe I'm homocentric. Um, and it's probably true that whales and palm trees would be better off without us. 
Uh, it's also possible that a robot-run planet would not be the apocalyptic, war-torn darkness of the Terminator franchise, but a utopia of self-repairing solar-powered machines that enable the lion to lie down with the lamb. But I don't care. I am on team human. Uh, and the limit of my interest is how humans can organize themselves better in our own interests. And that's because um, I love us, even though we're a bit weird. Um, ask a Westerner how many Muslims live in their country. Chances are they will overestimate by between 10 and 15 times. Uh, if you ask a Westerner how many women experience sexual harassment, they will underestimate by a half. People are strange. We are weak. We are hamstrung by our cognitive biases. We are naive and foolish and prejudiced. We live in stories, not facts. We're also a source of extraordinary compassion, bravery, understanding, and innovation. And whether good or bad, we are all that we have. In places like this university and in the halls of Whitehall, we tend to expect intellectual consistency from people. I think we're wrong to do so. The only people who try to post hoc rationalize all of their opinions into an ideology are politicians and academics. Um, I don't know if you've uh, subscribed to it, but you should. The British Election Study has this amazing Twitter bot that tweets out every hour a randomly selected voter with their age, their opinions on Brexit, the economy, and where they sit on the political spectrum. And it's brilliant because there are you know, Lib Dem voters who say that they're very right-wing, uh, self-described left-wing Labour voters with a university degree who support the death penalty and Brexit. And it's a brilliant reminder of how unpredictable individual people are. Our, our tendency, in fact, our need when we're looking at statistical models to think about averages blurs away the edges of individual variation. When we design for the averages, we end up missing out most people's needs. Far too many policymakers try to design policies that require people to transform their nature towards that average. Uh, let me give you an example. So one of my research interests is, is financial inclusion, ensuring that everyone has fair access to affordable financial products and services. Um, basically, loads of people get into a financial crisis or unsustainable debt because they struggle to understand the products and services available to them. You go and talk to the banks or the treasury about this, they will always tell you that the answer is financial education. But the funny thing is, there is not a single scrap of evidence anywhere in the world that financial education improves people's financial outcomes. It's the products and services that need to change, not the people, because changing the people is basically impossible. Um, my basic view is that if you've designed a system that requires people to stop being human, then you've designed the wrong system. If we can't get rid of the problems or the people, uh, we're left with only two things we can change, the politicians and the experts. I think that uh, both need to change. But let's start with the politicians because it's more fun. Um, it has long been said that you campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. But I think this divergence is growing. Uh, now we campaign in cat memes and we govern in V lookup tables. Um, and this is an explicit strategy for many people in Westminster. It, I guess, to completely separate what you say and what you do. Um, bluster and obfuscation and fireworks on one side while you do the right policy over here on the quiet and hope no one notices. Um, Blairites used to explain that this was why Labour had so many daft policies, like marching criminals to the cash point. It was literally a kind of magician's distraction technique. And this is probably what Boris was up to on Brexit. Basically, act like a psycho for a couple of months, so no one notices when you fold and make the big concessions like, I don't know, carving off one of the constituent nations of the United Kingdom. Um, and there are loads of people in politics who think that this is just, that's what politics is for. Uh, and I think it's an incredibly dangerous game to play because eventually that divergence gets so distant that nobody believes anything that government does. And that's a problem. And people do notice policy change happening. And they deserve to be part of the choice. Government um, avoided controversy in the 90s by not telling people loudly that it was equalizing the pension age between men and women. And a generation of women feel betrayed because they thought they were going to retire at 60, and now they're going to retire at 67. It's a perfectly good policy, but actually you can't just not tell people about it. It's a really shitty way to behave. Um, I, think, I think the election has... Um, so I wasn't expecting that I would give this lecture during an election. Mike and I agreed a date, and then, you know, politics happened. Uh, but it's given me a lot 
more material for being worried about the state of our democracy. Um, there's a journalist called James Bloodworth who wrote a book called Hired, which is about the, uh, the gig economy. Uh, and he wrote yesterday that he'd probably spoil his ballot. He said, um, it shames the whole democratic process that the system has propelled such a broad sweep of mediocrity to the front line of politics. Um, and I, I think that mediocrity is a very generous word to use. Um, the sins of this election are well, endless, basically. Lies, exaggeration, hubris. Uh, I think my highlight, I don't know if you've seen it, would be um, Michael Gove in a farmyard being asked why the Conservative Party had changed their Twitter name to pretend to be an independent fact-checking organisation. Because the intellectual contortions that he went through to justify this were truly extraordinary. And, and the animal manure in the background simply added a kind of <laughs> poetic resonance. Um, but, you know, like, it's not just the Tories, right? There's Jeremy Corbyn on Andrew Neil talking about anti-Semitism as if it, you know, didn't matter. Uh, Liberal Democrat bar charts. Uh, and these multi-party deba debates that are honest, has anybody managed to sit through one of them? They are almost literally unwatchable. Uh, it's kind of incomprehensible grandstanding. And the, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies says that when it comes to tax and spend, they're all lying to us. Uh, in fact, the Conservative Party, having promised to put up tax in its manifesto just a few days ago, today has decided that, in fact, it's going to cut taxes in February. Uh, so if you don't understand what's going on, that makes you really quite sensible. Um, but the thing is this, that I find it quite hard to blame the individual politicians um, I think the problem is the game and not the players. I even, I confess, felt some sympathy for Michael Gove because he was doing what he had to do under the rules of the game as it is played. This is a system that promoted to the top people who wouldn't just cut off their nose to spite their face. They would cut off their face to spite their nose. And uh, I think any student of politics in the last three years would tell them that it's the right thing to do. Um, so I worked in the coalition government. Uh, it had its faults, um, but it was also a lot better than the governments that succeeded it, in my view. But basically, Nick Clegg and the Liberal Democrats put country before party to enable a period of stable government at a time of national crisis, and they were obliterated for that. Now, the lesson that teaches politicians is that you should put the party first, not the country. Then in 2017, Theresa May published a manifesto which tried to actually tell the truth about the hard choices of public spending. Talked about a dementia tax. Talked about means testing winter fuel payments. And what happened is that she lost her majority. So the lesson for politicians from that is for God's sake, whatever you do, don't tell the truth. So they don't. We're in this kind of Dutch auction of worsening behavior. If the other guy fights dirty, you have to fight dirtier. Michelle Obama may tell us that when they go low, we should go high, but the problem is when you go high, you lose. Um, in business, we tend to use regulation to stop companies from destroying each other in this way. But there's no one to save the politicians from themselves, just an increasingly tribal group of party members egging their leaders on. And the more we encourage internal party democracy, the worse that that gets. I think if we're to have a hope of restoring trust between citizens and the institutions which should serve them, we need a new politics of consensus and not division. So um, representative democracy is a really useful part of a decision-making system, but I have come to the conclusion that it is insufficient. Um, I was at the Battle of Ideas a few weeks ago on a panel uh, with some people who were all arguing for different kinds of democratic reform. And what struck me as odd is that they were all arguing for one piece of democratic reform. So there was a guy who wanted a different voting system, someone who wanted to decide literally everything by referendums, um, and somebody who wanted all public policy decisions to be made in a kind of collaborative way on a kind of GitHub of, uh, of public policy. But, you know, the, it's like DIY enthusiasts arguing about which is the best tool. Right? Like, you need a drill and a saw and a screwdriver if you want to build a bookcase, right? So why do we have to assume that democracy has to have only one facet in order to work? It seems to me that all of these tools could be useful and, in fact, should be deployed in the service of proper inclusion of people in decision-making. So that will include online deliberation. There are kind of pioneering projects in 
uh, Taiwan in particular, but also Estonia and Finland, enabling people, yes, to participate in discussion forums online that are well designed to encourage the building of consensus instead of a kind of descent into uh, warfare and rape threats like, like Twitter is. Uh, citizens' assemblies are a fantastic way of building not just consensus, but also legitimacy for difficult, hard-to-navigate policy questions. We also should have a better voting system and better processes of consultation. Um, we shouldn't limit ourselves to only one hammer and assume that that's going to fix everything. It's instead of replacing representative democracy, we should be supplementing it. Uh, but first, I have a kind of mad proposal uh, which is that we should stop thinking about elections as having a winner. A winner who gets everything and a loser who gets nothing except to sort of sit on the sidelines and whinge for five years. Um, take 2015, when the Conservatives got a majority, they got 11.3 million votes. The Labour Party got 9.3 million votes. And that, like, if it wasn't for Theresa May calling an election, which is obviously a bit foolish of her, that would have been it for five years. And that means that 11.3 million people are getting everything they want-ish, and 9.3 million people getting literally nothing of what they voted for. And that's actually a kind of weird settlement when the parties agree on a whole range of things, and more importantly, the voters agree on far more than the parties do. Um, now, of course, if you have a majority, it does mean that you do have enough people in your tribe to do whatever you like, but that's no reason why you should. I think that every MP has a legitimate claim to represent their constituents and therefore should have a role in the big decisions, not as lobby fodder, but as part of a genuinely cross-party process to decide the long-term future of the country. If you look at our parliament, basically the only bit that has been functional, even through the last three years, is the select committees. Because they actually ask people from different traditions, different expectations and different backgrounds to think together about what the answer is. And they actually come up with good, long-term, sustainable solutions. I don't really care if the winning party takes the great offices of state and the ministerial cars, but when it comes to lasting policy change, we should not make cross-party working the exception. It should be the rule. Um, whether it's encouraging pension savings, social care, NHS funding, housing reform, climate change, I actually think that getting a decision that can last for the long term is far, far more effective than exactly what that decision, what that settlement is. We have these ministers who flip in and out of posts all the time, and we wonder why policy ends up as a complete mess. We are reliant on the kind of individual brilliance of individual ministers. And, you know, the truth is actually most ministers aren't brilliant because most people aren't geniuses. You know, it's just a sort of natural fact of humanity. If we had long-term settlements, we wouldn't need to rely so much on those individual ministers. Uh, an example that we had in England and Wales is we used to have this uh, development land tax um, on, on housing, which was designed to take some of the value from land and recycle it into providing infrastructure. But basically, the Labour Party introduced it. And all the landowners said, don't want to pay that. I'll just wait till there's a Conservative government. So they didn't raise any money. Then along comes a Conservative government, abolishes the tax. People sell their land. Along comes a Labour government, says we're going to bring back the development land tax because there's really unfair gains here. You end up with the policy turning off and on and never having any effect at all. Actually, for not just some, most of these big macro challenges from climate change to funding our public services, actually that long-term settlement and the long-term stability that's still democratically accountable is far more important than the details. Um, The question, of course, is whether Boris Johnson actually wants to get anything done. Um, and I, I honestly don't know. So I, I was once in a taxi with Nick Bowles, a very nice chap, and he told me that um, the funny thing about lots of conservatives is that they were only in politics to keep the Reds out. <laughs> that they felt that, that literally the most useful thing they do was occupy the government to stop it from doing things, sort of long-term political <laughs> sit-in. But I have to assume that... Um, any Prime Minister will get bored, eventually. Uh, and so our Prime Minister, if he wants to do stuff, is going to have to find a new way of navigating public opinion. You know, political memoirs are always filled with examples of things the government wants to do but can't get people to agree to. I mentioned Charles Clark's book, The Too Difficult Box. And politicians usually use one of two strategies. One is to do the unpopular stuff as quickly as possible 
so that the public have a few years to forgive you. And the other is commissioning basically an expert to tell them what to do. So uh, that might be Derek Wanless, who told Gordon Brown that if he wanted to spend more money on the NHS, he was going to need to spend more money on the NHS. And he spent 500 pages telling Gordon Brown that, but enable Gordon Brown to sort of build a sense of legitimacy that I'm just doing what the experts told me. I think that the scale of change we need to go through is so vast that the first tactic won't work. Uh, it's just not fast enough. Um, five years is not enough to forgive people for uh, the level of kind of public service change. And, and tactic two falls down because um, as Michael Gove, I've talked about him a lot, that's a shame, never mind, um, told us in that, in that election, in the referendum campaign, is people are fed up of listening to experts, especially experts who tell them to pay more for worse public services. Um, Social care is really interesting. We had in endless independent reviews, right? So there was a royal commission in the early 90s. Then Derek Wanless did another review of it. Then uh, Andrew Dilnot did another review of it. And none of those expert recommendations have been sufficient to get over the basic hurdle that people resent paying for care, whether it's through taxes or charges. Um, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2010, we were on the brink of a cross-party settlement. Um, the Labour government had negotiated uh, between the three parties. Um, and George Osborne knew that basically the proposal on the table was an estate tax to pay for a much, much more generous social care system. But of course, estate taxes are pretty unpopular, especially with the kind of people most likely to vote Conservative. So he basically torched that nascent cross-party consensus for the sake of some really, really effective campaign posters, promising that the Conservatives would never impose a death tax, and that's why people should vote for them. And the reality is that like, it worked. It's hard to blame him for doing so when the political incentives encourage you to do precisely that. So why would he do anything else? Uh, Labour's attack on Theresa May's <coughs> dementia tax was exactly just as effective. But the result means that we are 10 years on from that cross-party settlement. And what is the Conservative Party's policy? It's to have a cross-party settlement. And the funny thing is, unless you change the rules of politics in some way, it is not in the Labour Party's interests to say yes. It's actually in their interests to watch the social care system degenerate and collapse in order to persuade people that they need to vote Labour. If you want to get something done, you have to change the rules of politics so that getting things done wins you more approval, not less. Uh, it would, of course, take a bold leader to offer power back to his opponents just as he got his paws on it. But I think we need bold leadership if we are to navigate our way through the challenges of the 21st century. And Boris Johnson has promised, it was one of his four campaign pledges, that he will unite the country. So let's take him at his word. I think this is how he should do it. But of course, he should put the people in charge, not just the politicians. All those policies in that too difficult box should be delegated not to a wise council of experts, but in my view, to a randomly selected jury of citizens, which would bring forward proposals for change. This is a way in which I'm talking about supplementing representative democracy. Uh, these formal assemblies should be combined with those kind of digital methods of deliberation that Taiwan and other countries have used, because this will help to build legitimacy for our politics and set new standards and expectations for future engagement with citizens. The reality is that all policy decisions have trade-offs. They have winners and they have losers. There are rivals, there are first movers, and there are laggards who are frightened of change. And instead of pretending these are way or settling for a system which means one side gets to win for a bit, only to be kind of faced with a punishment beating when the other party gets in, we should try and build consensus by bringing those opponents together in an open, honest process. I know because I've talked to people a lot about deliberative democracy, I know the arguments against it, right? So there are two. One is that people believe, coming back to the kind of anti-democratic sentiments that are growing, people believe that people would just choose wrong. And they also think that we haven't got time. Now, I am convinced that both those arguments are born of technocratic arrogance. Will people choose the wrong thing? Well, it depends what you mean by wrong. We have lived through this kind of long era of celebrating technocracy. So Tony Blair used to say, 
uh, what matters is what works. And he used this to kind of close down ideological disputes about, for example, private involvement in the NHS or taxes on the rich. And David Cameron actually continued with some of that. He set up this What Works network to build and disseminate evidence throughout government. In fact, I helped to make sure that that happened because I think um, technocracy is probably my natural habitat. Um, uh, but um, it's no good, of course, saying let's do what works unless you've defined what you want to happen. You need an outcome before you can analyze what works to achieve it. And that a huge number of kind of angry disputes with experts that help to devalue experts in public eyes are actually about this simple misunderstanding. Right? Take crime, where I started. So Michael Howard said prison works. And there's a whole load of criminologists who will tell you very firmly that prison does not work. And the problem is that they are actually both right. It just depends what you're claiming prison works to do. Does prison work to drastically curtail an individual's ability to commit crime whilst they are inside the prison walls? Clearly, the answer is yes. But does prison work to help turn people away from crime and turn them into law-abiding citizens? Pretty much no. And does prison work to deter people, potential criminals, from committing crime? Maybe a bit sometimes. But I think experts do themselves a disservice when they have an entirely different conversation from the public and say that policy doesn't work when what they mean is that they don't like what it seeks to accomplish. I think technocrats also need to reduce the canvas of public policy that they seek to dominate. There are, of course, lots of questions with a correct answer, but there are far more where the only answer that matters is the one we can agree on. Um, you can separate questions into two broad categories, right? There's discovery, where there is a correct answer, and agreement, where the right answer is simply the one everyone agrees on. So if I asked you, what is the quickest way to the station from here? There is an answer. We could ask an expert, and it would be testable with evidence as to whether they were correct. That's discovery. But what I've got written down here is if I asked you what color we should paint the ceiling, but of course that's not gonna work because the ceiling is quite hard to paint. So what happens if we're like, what color should we paint the floor? Um, they, like, there just isn't a correct answer. Um, you need a process by which you come to a shared decision and a decision whereby the right answer is established not by fact, but by the fact that it builds consensus. And these are agreement decisions. The process confers legitimacy. And basically, I think in public policy, we have treated far too many decisions as discovery and left them to experts to find the right answer. Neglecting the fact that the process of making decisions is something pretty vital to us as humans. Having someone else decide and hand down the answer is incredibly alienating. So uh, about 10 years ago, my husband and I spent the new year in Bulgaria at a ski resort in quite literally the worst hotel I've ever set foot in. Um, and it was full board, but the catering was so bad that like everybody, including the impoverished students, like ate elsewhere. Paying for anything was better than, than the free food in, food in the hotel. Um, so I, the first night, we didn't know this, right? So I'd picked my way through some spaghetti that had been cooked into basically a solid slab of carbohydrate that you had to slice. Uh, and a bit demoralized, still hungry, I said to my husband, can you go and get me some pudding? Um, and he brought me back an orange that had gone moldy around the top. And obviously, I was like outraged. Um, and he told me, no, no, this is the best thing that they have. But of course, I did not believe him. Um, but I went up to the counter and I discovered that, of course, he was correct. The moldy orange was indeed the best thing on offer. Um, like, this is basically my metaphor for the technocratic model. We have been handing out moldy oranges to people in left behind towns and communities and expecting them to be grateful because we know, because we wrote it down on a paper, that there actually wasn't something better. Um, basically, we assumed that people would be pleased at being 2% better off than a counterfactual they never experienced. Even when they could see, whether it's in London and the Southeast or elsewhere, other people who were 100% better off. Uh, I've used this word counterfactual, which I learnt uh, on my first day in government from a guy called Callum Miller, who now runs the Blavatnik School of Government, which I understand is not as good as, <laughs> as the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. 
Uh, but anyway, Callum is an excellent person, almost as nice as Mike and Diane. Um, but it's such, like, oh, my God, it's such a technocrat word because there is no one working outside the field of public policy who uses it. It's a kind of wonkies. Um, and, right, so what a counterfactual is, is a thing that didn't happen, right? So you model out what would happen if you didn't do your policy, and you compare it to life with your policy, and then we assume that this little model on a piece of paper seen by, you know, three people, your manager and a minister, is enough to persuade the whole world that your policy is better than an alternative they don't experience. To be honest, it's astonishing that it took the Brexit vote to help us see that this wasn't working. I think people need the chance to make decisions themselves, even if that means that they might choose the wrong option. There is such a thing as objective truth, but infrastructure decisions, public spending, and how we structure our welfare system, these actually aren't one plus one. They're debatable, and we need to let people have that debate. Legitimacy is the most essential building block of lasting answers to the policy challenges that we face today. It's also why the argument that deliberative democracy is too slow also fall apart. Uh, I talk to climate change people, infrastructure people, public health people, and they all say, no, it's urgent. I know what the right thing to do is, so let's just get on. But, you know, there's a massive gap between knowing what the right thing to do is and persuading people to do it. And being right and being ignored is no more useful than being wrong. Um, I am a fan of The Apprentice. Do you watch The Apprentice? I mean, obviously, it's dreadful. Uh, but it makes me feel like I'm not a failure in life, basically. Um, I watch it with my daughter, who is eight, and she says, Oh, my God, she's such a bragger! Uh, and that makes me laugh. So, great. Anyway, so this thing happens on The Apprentice, right? So, obviously, they screw up, and they all do something stupid and bad. Uh, and then there's always one person who has said on, like, day one, This isn't going to work. And then they sit in the boardroom and they say to Lord Sugar, I knew it wasn't going to work, I said so. And he usually fires them anyway. And that's because being right and being ignored has no benefit to anyone except your ego. That's the problem with technocrats. They also need to understand that there genuinely is more than one right thing to do. Uh, and they might not actually have all of the answers. So uh, back to social care because it's such a kind of vast failure of public policy making. We have had three expert commissions uh, in the last 30 years, and they have all recommended different things. None of their proposals are perfect, but all of them would have been very, very substantially better than doing nothing, which is what we did. I think that legitimacy and implementation are far more important than the details. And yet, when any police publishes a social care policy, you will see experts everywhere picking it apart, even though basically, one way or another, it's going to crowbar 10 or 20 billion into the system. They're like, oh, but you know, the distributional impact for this. Be Shut up. If we could get something done, it would be so much better. As I said, at the beginning, I'm actually quite good at policy making. I'm quite good at picking apart distributional impacts of social policy um, because I, I, I think I'm quite a natural technocrat. So it's kind of um, taken me quite a long time to accept this idea that good policy isn't about personal genius. I think clever people like the ones in this room need to go through that quite important learning process at some point in their life that recognizing that the wisdom of all of us is greater than the wisdom of you, no matter how clever you are. Um, we all want to kind of have come up with the answer, but I don't think that should be our job. Experts need to serve a decision-making process that is led by others. Not, of course, just representative democracy. I've talked about why that's insufficient. But with representative democracy supplemented with deliberative democracy and a conscious attempt to build lasting consensus between people of different backgrounds and different ideologies, I think that will be a politics that's capable of listening to experts, even if it doesn't obey them all the time. Uh, when I was at Cambridge, I studied English literature. And so I just wanted to start with a bit of a 
literature thing. End, sorry, end. Sorry, don't want to frighten you. Um, so I, I was in this production of a play called uh, Antigone, uh, which is a Greek tragedy. It's dead good, you should totally read it. Um, and uh, I don't know if people know it, but basically, so Antigone is uh, a woman. She fights her uncle, who's the king, Creon, over the right to bury her brother's bones. Um, he had just led an attempted coup. So for Creon, basically his goal is, is to leave the bones rotting in the sunshine in order to help him establish his new political order. Um, religion and tradition, Antigone's on that side, dictate that he should be buried, so Antigone buries him, and then Creon unburies him, and then she buries him again, and then, of course, at the end, they're all dead. Because um, it's a Greek tragedy, and that's basically how it happens. Um, and the play for me, I, was, I, I went to a funny sort of retreat thing and had to read the play again, and... Uh, the kind of conventional reading is that it's about this difficult conflict between the demands of political order and rationality and, and tradition, ritual, and emotion. And I feel like that's a similar kind of... It, it maps quite well onto this sense of the, 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 the populist emotional response with the, with the technocratic one. Because uh, I think we're supposed to feel that um, because these bones can't be both buried and unburied the competing demands are unreconcilable, and that's kind of the heart of the tragedy. But I was reading this play again, and honestly, I just got really, really cross with them both. Because if only they had sat down at the negotiating table and talked to one another and been willing to compromise, they could, in fact, both have won. Heart and head can rule together. It is possible to, I don't know, believe in universal human rights at the same time as loving your family best. It's possible to listen to facts and listen to your instinct. In fact, we're better when we do. I think that Creon is wrong. That lasting political order doesn't come from crushing and humiliating your opponents, the saboteurs. It comes from finding an accommodation between your needs and theirs. And we should stop defining democracy by winning. In the end, democracy isn't about getting what you want. It's a finding what we can agree on. Before we Bloody go, elites. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very down-to-earth sparkling. Um, <laughs> uh, before we go and avail ourselves of it, um, yeah, I think we need to thank Polly for such a stimulating, thought-provoking lecture. Uh, I am going to be thinking when I go into vote next week all about mouldy oranges, actually, uh, as I'm putting my cross in the box and thinking, well, maybe it's maybe it's okay. It may have been a tattoo. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Um, so can you all please join me in thanking Polly?